Don't forget that your skin is your largest organ and the sun can be your skin's worst enemy. Dermatologists recommended Neutrogena products offer the ultimate protection for your skin. From makeup remover wipes to Hydro Boost Water Gel Facial Moisturizer, BJ's has your entire lineup of Neutrogena skincare products. And now through December 3rd, save $4 on any Neutrogena product at BJ's. Love your skin back and save now through December 3rd, only at BJ's. Today, we discuss Miro. Today, I want to talk about the hellscape that is technical diagramming, right? Everybody's nodding their heads right now, uh uh-huh. And there is a potential solution that I want to share. There was one name that several people brought up. I did some digging, and it's kind of nuts how much this program Miro has for developers. I have to share this. It could potentially be a game changer for you. So my favorite part about Miro is that half the work is already done. Like right now, typically we spend hours starting diagrams from scratch, gathering information. You get buy-in from every team. Uh, You know, that's a lot of work to do. But Miro has a full set of integrations with the tools you're probably already using. And they also offer open APIs and SDKs for custom solutions for all those niche diagramming use cases we have to do, right? So the end result is the same, but it doesn't take forever. It's a massive, massive time saver. I'm transforming basic flowcharts and network architectures, and it all lives in one place. So are you using Miro? Have you used it? I want to hear. That's M-I-R-O dot com. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the 2324 winter edition of the Transfer Committee podcast. I am Gags and I am back for this show, one night only, and uh, I will be playing the role of, I don't know, CEO, manager, whatever, one of those things. But uh, I am joined by the trusted group, my cohorts that you are here to listen to. Um, head of scouting, Mr. Dave Hendrick. How are you doing, Drake? Dave? Long time. I'm, David? I'm, I'm tremendous, Gags. I'm tremendous. It's it's Good nice day. of you to, you know, break your self-imposed uh, banishment of, from podcasts. Though I do know you did a, a minefield recently, yet I've had no texts about an old school. It just tells me that once again, you just don't care about the listeners. Well, well, he, well, Alan reached out to me, so we, you know, I was waiting for for you, but um, yeah. Well, what we'll do is the transfer window is coming, so we do need to get together. I think we do need to get together to to not do this type of show, but uh, a more fun one because you know the Mbappe rumors are back, and you know where they started. So hey, we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Thank you, Dave. Um, our head of data, Mister Dan Kennett, Darth, as we lovingly call him. How are you doing? I'm all right, boss. How are you, mate? Been a while. I know. It's been ages. Yeah, I'm doing good. Very good. Thanks. I know. Life I th- is very busy. Th- I think I think you may have I I think you may have done one UP this season. As yeah. An I emergency did one. stand in, didn't you? Absolutely. Was it a, yeah. Yeah. I did. I think it might have been at the summer summer holiday period or something like Bournemouth or something. <laughs> It might have been. But yeah, otherwise you are you you're definitely uh, in the supremo role now, just basically observing other people making a mess of things. Yes, I am. I am actually lots of decision making, lots of uh, seeing how things are going. It's actually really nice to be. You've gone, upsta- you've, gone up- you've gone upstairs, Gags. I have. I have. It feels great. I have to say, not doing <laughs> the hard work that you guys are all doing, but I do appreciate it. And I did listen to the uh, anniversary show. It was absolutely fantastic from Trevor and Dave. I need to tweet about that soon. Been very busy watching Steam Punk. But anyway, talking of Mister Punk, uh, our, our head of finance. Mr. Mo Chatra, how are you doing, buddy? <laughs> well, eating humble pie after you got it right around CM Punk and I, I didn't. didn't so. I didn't. It's just luck, mate. Just luck. <laughs> I did say, I did clarify that these things we get told by people and uh, we believe everything we, you know, that people in the know would know. We trust them. So, hey, it's all good. Anyway, we're here to talk. So this, we is the wrestling, do... this is the wrestling recruitment pod. 
the we rest will, of the we, we, we will do a fight fever on this soon, and I think we should get some time with Mo and uh, with Guy and whoever else wants to join it because it'd be a bit of fun uh, and talk and just, just dabble in it. But anyway, that's another pod we have, fight fever, coming soon. Um, we are looking at um, a few positions today, guys. Um, I think we said it was both fullback roles and the defensive midfield role. So as usual, we're going to go around. Um, we're going to go around, but I think first and foremost, I think we should go to head of finance and just double check what our budget's going to be for the winter, if that's okay. And also, what kind of you know, maybe if you want to update us on the non-homegrown thing, well, that might be good. Sure. So um, very simply, um, we have a hundred million to spend. We do know that we almost signed. Um, Caicedo for uh, about 150 million Um, and obviously that didn't quite pan out and then we went and uh, signed the next best thing if you believe some Um, you know a journeyman from the Bundesliga for nearly 100 million pound less than that so (laughs) if by the logic of the fact that we saved nearly 100 million pound on that deal um, that, that, that hence is the funds that are available for this window in terms of the non-homegrown player rule, um, there is currently one spot available. Um, so if we did decide to sign a couple of non-homegrown players, then we would potentially have to look at either excluding a player from the squad or uh, moving one of the players on um, non-homegrown players this January transfer window. The other alternative is to sign... Um, younger known homegrown players who wouldn't count towards the maximum of 17 that we're allowed. So we currently have 16, maximum allowed is 17, but if they're below a certain age, then um, they don't count towards that. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Some decisions to be made later on, I think. Um, Dave, shall we start with the... Defensive midfielder role, since that's the one I think where we could really do with um, with some bolstering. Yeah, so uh, this list was originally nine players. It has been reduced to eight. Uh, it was broken up into ready-made options, uh, young with big potential, and then kind of project players, so, you know, more teenager types. So initially, the the three in the ready-made category were Bubakar Kamara of Aston Villa, 24 years of age, just turned last week. We've talked about him before on this podcast. We've suggested him as a signing in the past. He is one of the best in the league in the position. He can also fill in across the defensive line. He's a natural leader. He's a good passer of the ball. He's outstanding defensively. The issue would be, would Aston Villa sell him in January? And the answer is probably no, unless you really are willing to go to the very outer limit of the budget to to buy him. Um, Czech de Kure was on this list, but he is now likely to miss the rest of the season with an Achilles injury. So there's no real point in us getting into the weeds on him. The other ready-made option then is Joe Polina of Fulham. He is 28 years of age, he'll turn 29 in the summer, but he doesn't have a huge amount of minutes in his legs. So he's played less minutes in his career than Marcus Rashford, as an example, and Rashford has just turned 26. So it could well be that you could get three or four good seasons out of him before he'd decline. And if you timed it right, you could probably ship him on to the Saudi Pro League who are, I think, going to be the exit clause for every club who makes a big transfer mistake over the next few years or or has a player who edges past the point of being worth what they're being paid. 6-3, physical, powerful, dominant ball winner, good passer, can score a goal. I think he's proven himself in the league to be capable of playing at a, a higher level than Fulham. So I, I do think he's a worthy candidate. Uh, the three sort of good enough to start straight away, but have potential to develop significantly 
Uh, Ezekiel Fernandez of Boca Juniors, who's played a starring role in their run to the Copa Libertadores final in a, what is genuinely the worst Boca team I can remember. Uh, Lucas Gorn Dote of Red Bull Salzburg, who is a dynamic ball winner, great shielder of the defence, not as good on the ball as Fernandez, but more dynamic, covers a bit more ground. And then the third one is Mats Viefer of Feyenoord, who's 6'3". Now, he's 24. He's a couple of years older than the other two. He's actually a week older than Kamara, but he's got less experience than Kamara. He's only played in his career 135 games um, at senior level. He only really became well-known last season, having played his first two years with Excelsior in the second division. He moved to Feyenoord last season, was vital in their winning of the Eredivisie title. He's having another very good year this year, and he stepped up the Champions League level and looks very much at home. Was outstanding last night against Atletico Madrid, has been good in the games against Lazio. Um, so he he would top out, I think, potentially a little bit below Gornado and Fernandez, but I think he's maybe a little bit ahead of them now in terms of readiness to come in and start for us. And he adds more physicality than they would. And then the three youngsters. Now, two of them aren't, they're not definite number sixes, but they're young enough and talented enough and have the attributes to be molded into the position. One is Arthur Vermeeren of Royal Antwerp, 18 years of age, outstanding young player. Um, So he's definitely one that I think is worth a look. The next is Archie Gray of Leeds. He's only 17. He has the potential to be the pe- the, the player that people think Declan Rice is. That's how good he can be. People think Declan Rice is this all-encompassing, do-everything world beater, and he just isn't. He's a good player, not a great player. Archie Gray can become a great player. He's already outstanding, starting regularly in the championship. Plays right back, plays central midfield, plays holding midfield can play an attacking midfield if needed. He's got star written all over him. And the third one is Gabriel Moscardo of Corinthians. He's 18 years of age, a proper ball-winning, shielding defender. He's got plenty of narl about him. He's super intelligent, has exactly the type of mindset you want in a young player. Fearless, good on the ball, very composed, likes to carry the ball, he reminds me of a young Roy Keane mixed with an old Roy Keane. Like he has Keane's dynamism of his youth and he has that snarl and bite of the latter years Keane, not to the point where it crosses the line as it often did with Keane, but that same type of, I'm going to be the one that goes and takes control of this game. I'm going to go and take the ball off you and we're going to start playing with it and you're not getting it back. That type of mentality. So, uh, that's the list. Now, I understand that the data department have two that they'd like to add to that, and that's fine. So, Dan, uh, you have two names. Um, you, you've I actually do. got three names. Yeah, three names. Just wanted to um, add in to your, for the scouting views. You've got Andre um, it from um, Fluminense, I think. Yeah. Uh, Martin, Martin Zubamendi, I, is it? Is it Sociedad? Sociedad, yeah. No. So, yeah, Sociedad and João Neves of... Of um, Benfica. Benf- Benfica. So... So, if you have any... Off- if you've got any up-to-date scouting reports, you could rustle upon those three. <laughs> yeah. With Andre, I think he would get absolutely roasted as a six in the Premier League. I think he's an eight in the Premier League. Defensively, he's worse than Alexis is. Um... He's not the most dynamic. He's quick enough over a short distance, but if you ask him to cover any kind of real dis- distance, he'll get roasted. He's also very small and quite lightweight, despite the fact he is really feisty and he does like to get stuck in. I think if if we had sold Ti- Tiago in the summer and not bought Gravenberg, then I would have said, bring in Andre, and you have Andre and McAllister rotating in one position. I would put Joe Neves in that same boat. For me, the comp for him is like a Barella type, like that real bustly, busy, 
will have good ball winning numbers, but if you have him as a shield, A, you're not going to get the most out of him, and B, he is going to struggle physically. Zubamendi, I love. My only real concern with Zubamendi is I worry about the mobility of a midfield pairing that has him and Alexis or him and Trent. I'd worry about the physicality of that midfield as well because he's about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, but he's quite slight. Now, he's outstanding on the ball and he reads the game at a really, really high level. So I could get on board with him, but we would want to be shoring our defence up quite heavily, I think, to get away with having a midfield that doesn't have that kind of physical presence in it outside of Dominic. The other two I would push back on. I I just don't think Andre makes sense for us. I think he needs to go somewhere now where he's going to play regularly. I don't think he plays regularly for us. I think Fulham is the move for him. I think that's where he will go. Um, I think to partner Polina ideally, if they can keep Polina, if we or somebody else buys Polina, I think they'll go again and buy somebody else. Neves, I really, really like. I just, I think he's an eight as well in the Premier League. I just think he's going to be a little bit too small to play as a six. And like, if you think back to say, like the best ball winner of the last decade has been N'Golo Kante. But when he was played as a lone six, his team struggled and he struggled because he wasn't as effective. It's when he's played with a sitter like drink water, bad and all as he was, that partnership worked. Um, it worked brilliantly with Matic because Matic would sit and hold and Kante could basically be like a free safety roaming around, no real obligation to hold a position, just go and win the ball for us and give it to somebody else. Neves, I think you could put into that type of role. Now, he'll offer more on the ball than Kante, and Kante was good on the ball, but Neves, I think, would be more suited to that type of roaming destroyer kind of role, but you've got to have a really solid defensive presence. And if you look at Benfica this season with him playing as a defensive midfielder, they're a mess this year. Dreadful in the Champions League, dreadful domestically, and a big part of it is he's not quite, he's just not quite, where you would want him to be defensively from a physical presence point of view. The world's got you feeling glazed over, sprinkle some love all around. Just climb your way up out of that hole and you'll be the taste of the town. Grab the one thing that everyone's loving and as it happens, they come by the dozen. Everybody loves a donut. Order a dozen from Duncan. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design T-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. Gags, do you want me to do some do you want me to do go, some numbers on these? Into the data, list? Yeah. yeah, yeah, let's go straight to the data. Yeah. So um just on um Moscato and, and Gray, um the the these these are very young boys, um and Moscato twelve hundred twelve hundred career minutes, Archie Gray fourteen hundred career minutes. So these are these are pure scouting picks. Um if we if we go down that road, um, there, there's nothing we can say really in the data department to, to add anything to those signings. But they're under 21 players, gag. So if we wanted to sign a project signing, um, yeah, they're not going to qual- they're not going to even come into the homegrown question yeah. or non homegrown for another Makes few sense. years yet. So so that that's that's something we might want to consider um, if for these sure. if these if the young teenagers are worth it. On the on the on the ready made ones, um I did I did prepare all the numbers on the before his before his injury as well, so I have them. It's such a um, shame. 
Yeah, um, it, it looks because it's a, it looks like it's a serious one, doesn't it? So uh, with his Achilles, um, yeah. So the the Polini is a is a. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to go for every data metric. I'm going to do what I'm going to do what I did on the summer part, which is I'm just going to highlight the real standouts and potential weaknesses of a player's numbers versus the average defensive player, the average player in this position. So I'm just going to, just going to talk about the really noteworthy numbers at either, either end. And the, the thing with Polinia, which does stand out across all of Europe is, is he's, he's a bit of a, a tackle volume. He's a dual volume monster. Um, he's not particularly pr- prolific at, the way to, which he wins them, he's just about average, right? But the rate, the amount of challenges he goes in for, is is quite something, and so that is that is particularly unique. So he definitely does get stuck in in old 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 parlance, um, and because of his height, he's I think he's the tall along with Vifa, he's the tallest player on this list, um, which is good. And his aerials are a standout, and he's and the, these aerials are he's got 62 percent win rate, and that's in the Premier League. So that 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 is good. That that's a good thing to have. Um, the issues with um, the concerns with um, Polinia are uh, all to do with uh, stuff which isn't involving duels, basically. And um, even when you were just for Fulham's possession, because Fulham are a less than fifty percent team, um, that it's it's not just the passing, um, it's not just the passing volume which is low, and the carries of volume. It, it, it's the actual accuracy at which he passes isn't great either, uh, particularly short passing. Um, so. <sighs> Yeah, if you wanted some, I mean, for example, Kamara is really good at what you would call the recycling. That's one of his statistical standouts: the way he controls the ball and the way he recycles in, in, in his short passing. Um, so that is um, the, 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 that's that was something I would have a nagging concern with with Polinia is okay. Yes, he can destroy stuff, and he, he's very, he's quite big. Um, other than the age, of course, but you know, Dave said there's mitigating factors on the age potentially. Is that can he can he do anything on the progressive side um, to the level that we would need a player uh, like that to do? Um, so you know, it might be able to translate gags, but there's a few things in there in the numbers that you'd look at and you think, well, in that that's not maybe that's not great, P- particularly short passing accuracy. You'd, you'd want. You want somebody who's a lock, really, in, in that kind of stuff. Um, and one thing I have done, Gags, by the way, is I have um, I've, I've included our, our ex first teamer, who was the regular in this position, Fabinho, and our new guy, Endo, in the in this analysis, just so we can see mm-hmm. where those guys compare. For example, on Endo, right, is <laughs> statistically speaking, compared to these guys here, the only things Endo Endo is is good at his aerials, right? And then his <laughs> in his production, which is actually, he does actually score and assist quite a bit, way more than the average player in his position, right? But if you look at his 1v1s and the way he can recycle and his short passing and how often he's caught in the ball, he's he's got weaknesses and red flags in all those categories. Um, so I'm wondering whether en- Endo is purely a, a stopgap for one year and we look to sell, you know, for example. Because, you know, if we're going to keep a player who is, a limited player who is a stopgap on a, you know, and he's taking up a, a non-homegrown spot as well, guys. That's definitely something you need to think about as well. Um, he seems like a stopgap, doesn't he? Yeah, like yeah. he really does. Like the fact that you said the only things he's good at, and they're not really defensive midfield. No, other than the aerials, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, aerials, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but Kamara, right? Um, he he is interesting. Um, because, like I said, he's got really good numbers: short passing, short pass volume, short pass completion. But also, there's uh, there's, there's lesser known categories for how often a player miscontrols a ball and how often they get caught in the ball. And he's very good at both of those as well. Um, so, yeah, he doesn't compete so much in the dual. He's not a dual monster like Polinia, but there's 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 yeah. He, there's a lot to like there on on, on Kamara in a different way. Zubamendi is the guy who actually profiles closest to Fabinho in terms of what his actual strengths were, which were, first of all, his control. He doesn't get caught on the ball, and he's very good in the air. He's also got, um, but he has got a low dual volume, but that could be um, his style. It could also be the impact of the Spanish league there. 
Um, and he's he he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't try to progress the ball himself. He's not a carrier or a dribbler from deep. So he, he don't expect him to see any, see him do any Joel Matip style surges, gags. You know, if that's what it's, if that's what you want in from occasional bursts from your from your from your six. But the Zubamendi, um, say he's he's just under six foot, but like Dave said, he is fairly slight. Um, but yeah, his his ability to to re- to recycle and to 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 not get caught out on the ball. I think that's a, I think that's a definite positive. But yeah, so if you wanted somebody who had similar strengths to Fabinho, then he's he's in that profile. Um, Andre, um, if you want somebody who is a dictator from deep and a, and a conductor, his passing, everything he does on the ball is outstanding. He's the best player on this list by a mile. Um, and that includes his passing, his short passing, and his long passing, his creativity, his take ons, and his carries. Um, but obviously, um, you've got to mitigate that against average or below average defensive attributes. And the um, team he plays in, like yeah. they're such a weird team, they'll gladly knock the ball back and forth between defensive midfielder and centre back yeah. six or seven times and wait for someone to sort of half press them and then spring a little bit like like Brighton do. Yeah, and we we don't play that kind of way. So you'd wonder in in our game where he's going not going to have as much time on the ball. And the, also the other thing to factor in, remember, is in the double pivot he's partnering Trent. So having a ball yeah. dominant it, player, it was like the same is, same, yeah, same player, yeah, yeah. Like you said, he was the Tiago replacement, but we hmm. already signed the Tiago replacement, haven't we, in the squad? Um, Ezekiel Fernandez has some nice highlights um, and no real lowlights either. Although you got to remember, he is playing in the uh, in the Argentine league, um, which is you know the next tier down below the, the big five leagues. Um, his his passing is decent. Um, he's got decent numbers there, and also his recoveries, which is always a, a good proxy for how energetic he is and getting about the pitch as well. Gag. So he, I think he's I think he's the best on this list for recoveries actually um, of all the players, which is to his credit. Uh, yeah, he is. Yeah, he's the he's the best player on this for recoveries. Um, his only re- re- weakness there, and this could be a low sample size and small data, is the actual miscontrols and how often he um he he actually. I don't know if his touch is bad, but this is the we had it with um who was the German fellow we scouted last year and then we didn't sign him because he had a bad injury record and then he got a bad injury. Um, Gladbach lad, Manicone, Manicone, Coney, and we said the same thing about Coney last year. That that you know he's got this weird number in stats where he looks like he miscontrols the ball a lot. And and you said Dave, it's because he, it's because he gets in. He basically spends his whole match fighting with somebody, like in terms of like dueling with somebody. Mm. So he's always in real close proximity to somebody, whether he's being fouled or in the process of fouling somebody. And you know maybe that reflects in the, the miscontrol. He would be the same as well. And like the other thing with him that I've noticed is he'll often try and use his touch to play himself into space. So there's a, there's a lot of those that just end up squarely yeah. away from him and somebody Overruns, snaps in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they'll, they'll yeah. all factor against him as well. He does have, like, he's a really nice passer of the ball, but he's one of those players that might think he's a slightly better passer than he actually is. Right. I don't know if that reflects in the data, how his passing stats are, but... There's just yeah. sometimes he plays balls and you think that's a little bit ambitious now for what you're actually capable of at this stage. Yeah. And I know it's Argentine league versus Premier League, but he averages 276 progressive meters in passing. Right. And that, that's second on this list to Andre. Right. And for example, Joe Polini is 130 meters per match. So he's almost double, more than double in terms of progression. So there's, there's definitely something to look at there with Fernandez for sure. Um, in terms of that, because it he does have some nice features in there, and you know, it's not like we haven't um, teams in the Premier League haven't bought well bought players directly from Argentina, and they've turned out to be pretty good straight away. Um, Mats Vifa, another interesting one here, um, because he is he is a big player. He's 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 he's, he's six foot three, same as same as Polinia. Um Doesn't have many weaknesses in the data, but we do have to be careful because he is playing for a good team in the Eredivisie. Like we always say, there is a big Eredivisie tax on players, Um, and so he he's got he's he's got good passing numbers. Um, He's got good production in terms of actual end product. He's very good in the air, and he's also far more of a dribbler from deep than say Polinia is, who doesn't dribble at all, actively avoids it. Whereas Vifa 
has got some decent dribbling numbers. Um, yeah, and he's he's doing almost five aerials a match for um, for Feyenoord. So the, the 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 thing which I like about him is you've got this year's Champions League group campaign to to say okay to test him against you know where you've got six matches against higher quality opposition and um, he. He's had a pretty decent campaign, I think it's fair to say, Dave. And his yeah. data is, 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 is it's holding up, if you like. Uh, I would say high opposition and Celtic. <laughs> 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 Brendan. <laughs> well, Bre- Brendan in Europe. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, Atletic, Atletico Madrid and Lazio are both good teams, particularly Atleti this season are playing very, very well. Mm. And last night, I, I would, even though his team lost, um, they lost 3-1. Funnily enough, they scored two own goals in that game. But I would say he was the best player on the pitch in that game last night. Mm. Oh, by the way, Dave, did you know that uh, Brendan Rodgers has the worst record, I think, of any Champions League coach to play at least, to manage at least 40 matches? If, if it wasn't for the fact that that r- record will continue to get worse and worse, I'd get it tattooed on me at this point because I dislike <laughs> him that much. <laughs> yeah. I just saw that somewhere this week on the Champions League show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but FIFA, um, the only minor possible wrinkle is his actual own 1v1 rate, which is slightly below the average for the position, but only slightly, not massively. But otherwise, no real weaknesses in the data. So it's, that's in, that's really interesting. Uh, Gorna Duath is... Um, the thing to like about here is again he's played the pre- he's played the Premier League and he's a Red Bull product. We love Red Bull products. He's only twenty, so he'd have one year of being under twenty one, but not qualifying here. Um, I think though it's fair to say, Dave, he is on a lot of teams' radars. Yeah, very much so. He was the player that Brighton seemed set on in the summer as their Caicedo replacement, mm. and then they obviously went for uh, Carlos Baliba instead. Um, mm. Why? Whether that was just that Salzburg weren't prepared to sell him or not, I don't know. The only real knock I could have on him is that, as with pretty much every 20-year-old player that's ever existed, he's a little bit inconsistent. But aside from that, I yeah. think from a physical point of view, like he's 6'1", he's strong, he's rangy. Like if you stood him next to Fabinho from a just a pure eye test physical point of view, he's very similarly built to Fab. Um, he's a bit more dynamic than Fab, but he has that same kind of wiry strength as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do, so do you have recommendations and stuff? And go, go on, go on to what is, uh, the only data we have is European data for him on Salz. We don't have Austrian League, I'm afraid, Gax. Um, but but he is in demand, so I think it's fair to say he is well-liked across Europe. Um and the same with Vermeer in, um, um again, Belgian league there. Um, but yeah, he's a, he's a pure project player. He's only 18. So, I mean, Kamara, Kamara looks good, right, in the data. Um, the issue is there is availability. How di- how difficult is it to make that deal with, with Villa? Um, if we're going wider, um, I'd have to say, if it's a pick, if you, if you have to, if you have to pick a, between Polini and Vifa, I, I, I will go for Vifa because the data is fairly similar. He's got more strengths to his game in terms of his dribbling and his carrying, and he's not going to have the Premier League premium in terms of money. And he's, he's four, four years, years younger. younger. Yeah, so that's, that that's probably half the price. Yeah, so so and he's attainable. You can get players out of the Dutch league, right? Um, although maybe we could have you know, anyway. We're not going to go there with our Dutch players. A third um, of the price. A third yeah. Of the price. Yeah. Um, Fernandez is definitely worth a look um, because there's there's nothing wrong with his data at all. It's Argentinian league, but that has translated well for a lot of teams, you know, in recent years. Um, so he is definitely worth a look, um, and Zuba Mendy is definitely worth a look as well. He's he's 24, like 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 Vifa, and then the other the other ones are projects. So um, maybe not, you know, gonna maybe Fernandez might be more ready to achievable than Gorna Duat and then you've got um, Archie Gray and Moscardo who are just teenagers so and they would be pure projects Okay thank you Mo do you want to go through the prices of these guys? Yeah sure so um, let's start with the more uh, established players Um, so Bubakar Kamara um, I initially valued him at 55 million but then uh, Upon further consideration, I thought that might be slightly on the lower side. Um, the 
Lavia transfer fee, um, which was higher than that, is being a bit of a benchmark of, of sorts uh, for players in that position. Um, so I think if that player with his lack of experience went for um, you know a fee close to 60 million, um, I don't think Villa would be looking to depart with Kamara for less than that. So I actually think that we're probably looking at around 65 million, um, if not more, um, to tempt Villa. Um, the same valuation I've actually applied to Palinia. Um, you know, he is a player whose contract um, extends for another year beyond that of Kamara's all the way through till June 2028. Um, and though he is 28 years of age, um, you know, we do know that uh, he, he nearly went to Bayern um, for a fee that was lower than that, but not too far off. Um, but obviously with the Premier League clubs, there's always uh, a premium to be paid. Um, so I think 65 million is a fair valuation um, to potentially tempt Tony Khan to do away with Polina. Um Moving on to um, some of the other players. So um, Ezekiel Fernandez um, of Boca, um, I value at 20 million, which would be actually a record transfer fee um, for that club. Um, also a player who will be on uh, relatively low wages as well. Um, Lucas Gornaduat is a player that I valued slightly higher at £30 million, um, obviously uh, playing in Europe already um, and for a club that is well-versed at um, selling their talent for a premium. I, I think £30 million is a fair valuation. Um, that's Wefa is a player that I valued at £20 million, um, though his contract does extend through till 2027. Um, final traditionally don't sell um, their stronger players for huge transfer fees. So 20 million should be um, enough to price him away from there. Uh, moving on to uh, Niran. Um, he's a player that I actually value at 25 million. He's a player that has attracted a lot of interest from a number of the uh, leading clubs around Europe. Um, so I think that 25 million in January, um, that, though he's an 18 year old, relatively inexperienced, might seem on the higher side due to the demand that it already exists. And if he continues with the upper trajectory, um, you know, that, that figure could be significantly higher come the summer. Um, Gabriel Moscardo, um, I valued at uh, 15 million. Um, so he is a player that, um, again, is at a club that um, historically hasn't departed with players for massive fees. Um, Archie Gray, I've valued at the same amount of 15 million. A player also that wouldn't be on high wages. Um, and then moving on um, to the players that we've just talked about. Um, so Zubi Mendy, um, has a release clause of uh, 53 million pounds. Um, though I should um, clarify, it's actually a buyout clause, which means that the player officially would have to pay that. Um, though the way it would work is that we would uh, transfer the funds to the player. The player would then um, transfer the money to the club. Um, Andre, um, 30 million pounds has been a figure. Um, that has been suggested in in recent weeks as uh, one that um, potentially would be enough to get that deal done. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about him potentially being linked with Fulham, um, and the figure of thirty million has been largely linked with them. Um, but I'd like to think that we you know we could get him for the same amount. Um, and then finally, um, João Neves, a player that um, has had a lot of hype around him has reportedly got a release clause of in the region of about 105 million pounds. I don't think um, that um, that figure would be needed to price him away. Um, but that said, um, you know, he, he's a player that might be seen as um, the Premier League's uh, latest version of perhaps Enzo Fernandez. Dave might disagree. Um, and obviously we know the kind of fee that he went for when he joined Chelsea. So 
yeah, though I don't think 105 million would be needed, I still would suspect that uh, we'd be looking at the region of 70 million plus um, to get him in. So he, though he's a young, inexperienced player, uh, relatively speaking, um, you know, the demand is definitely high for him and he's one of the more sought after players um, on the continent. Um, so, you know, given the transfer budget, um, I would suggest that, you know, as talented and as much potential as he has, maybe he's a player that um, wouldn't warrant, warrant the kind of fee that would be needed to sign him. Benfica do tend to insist on the buyout if it's January and then they'll negotiate if it's summer. So you might get them cheaper in the summer if you're willing to wait. But in January, I think they'd be, yeah, 70 would probably be the low point of what they'd accept. So are we looking at we for up and here? I would go, I would go we for on the basis that he's already shown himself to be a Champions League caliber player. He's already in Europe. It's an easier adaptation for him. We have a group of Dutch players in the squad, so we'd have some familiarity with them having been in the international. We have a Dutch manager, Dave. Well, we have a Dutch manager as well, like our our Galaxy Brains manager, um, under the guise, under the 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 authority, of course, of our German director of football. But we do have a a Dutch (laughs) a Dutch manager who's uh, who's making the decisions. I I think Weefer would just have an easier time, like settling in straight away. Like I, I've always, we've always talked about Enzo Fernandez, and when he came across from River Plate to Benfica, mm. we we turned down. Jurgen turned down the chance to buy him, and people have said, "Oh, well, you know, we could have bought him." Then the thing is, there's no guarantee that he would have immediately settled in. It, having that six months in Portugal did him a lot of good. Now you can point at Julian Alvarez, but he did have basically twelve months of being useless before he became useful for Man City after the World Cup. So I don't know. It's it's hard to know how he would how Ezekiel would, would settle in. The other thing to factor in with with Ezekiel and with um with Andre is like they're just finishing their domestic seasons now. So you're asking them, you'd be asking a player coming from South America if they were coming in to be a starter like Ezekiel would, you'd be asking him to basically have a month off and then come straight back into another season, which is a big, big ask. You know, the difference with, say, Moscardo would be you'd be bringing him in as a project. He wouldn't be coming in as a starter. So you could give him basically three months of training as a preseason and then kind of unleash him in in whatever games you, you feel necessary in the last two. Um, I, I would go Vifer. Ideally, I would say go Vifer and Moscardo. You get Vifer for now, even if he doesn't have the highest ceiling, he'll give you he can give you two to three really good years, and then you can move him on at a profit, and then Mascardo is ready to take over that role. Is he available in January as well? If if if, if Feyenoord don't qualify for them from the group, which looks likely. Feyenoord, I don't think can qualify from the group. Oh, they can't do it. It's already it's already decided. It's already decided. I think they've got okay. four points less than Lazio okay. yeah, with one game to right. play. So I'd I'd imagine he will be available. Yeah. Um, the thing that's that's really positive about him is last season he played in a double pivot with Ergen Koku. Yeah. And Koku was kind of the star name. And we talked about him in the summer transfer committee pods. Yes. And the, the worry was what happens if he goes, can Viefer take on more of the ball playing responsibility? And to his credit, he has grown exponentially mm. in terms of his all round influence on that team this season with, without having Koku there. So that's a really positive sign that maybe he's just a bit of a late bloomer and maybe this is just the very early doors of what he's going to be. Remind um, me of pace-wise, what's he like pace-wise? Do you have any numbers on his pace or anything like that? Or? I did ask the, the sports science department for this information, but they let me down, Gags, I'm afraid. Fucking unreliable. I'll get the stack pace. <laughs> Just can't, just can't, can't be trusting these people from Derby. Can't be I know. That's outrageous. Uh, he is he is decently quick. He's not like a big cumbersome lump. He is decently quick. Yeah. I asked, by the way, I asked our Erdovizzi scout, um, Patrick, on Under Pressure Discord about FIFA because I said he was on the shortlist. 
And he he said um, he's a good player, key player for slots, who's the manager, and Feyenoord. His best quality, in his opinion, is intercepting, recovering possession, and often higher up because he plays in a pressing system. Uh, he covers a lot of ground. He's Feyenoord's most defensive midfielder in the current version of the 4-2-3-1. Uh, he's alongside uh, Timber this season, who's more of a box-to-box, and um, and Vifa plays the protective role of the, of the two. Um, he's very comfortable on the ball as well, to be fair. Yeah, he said he's a good ball recycler, can receive under mm. pressure and play one-touch passes. Not sure what his ceiling is, though. He doesn't have the obvious talent of, say, a Gravenberg, right? which is who would another talented Dutch player, obviously. Um, so he has intelligence and tactical ability to be an important player in a footballing side. I think that's a... And, but whether it can translate to one of the best teams in the world, that's the question, isn't it? You, you but know, you know what? Even if it's a stopgap for the, for the you know, for a couple of years, like as in, oh, not just a couple of years, but 20 million. Is it 20 million we're looking at? 20 million. Like, like you could you buy know, him now. And you can sell him for 40, choice. like in a year's time, a year and yeah. a half's time. Yeah. Honestly, and it's not, it's like... I think it's fair to say, if you look at the data now, there's no question that he's a a better data profile than Endo. No question. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, he's used to playing in a winning team. And I I kind of feel like that matters. He's used to playing in a winning team that dominates the ball. He's got that kind of we're better than you mindset. Whereas I look at Endo at times and he's coming from Stuttgart and they've, they've been treading water in the Bundesliga the last couple of years. They've been relegated with him in the team. They've obviously had that one season of promotion, but it's a lower league. And I just kind of feel like he almost brings that I'm not really supposed to be here type of mentality himself. Like there's times he gets the ball and I don't want to be mean to the guy, but he looks a little bit like a raffle winner. Like the ball gets stuck between his feet and he does really weird shuffles. Like he doesn't know which foot he's meant to kick it with. And a lot of it, just I, I, he's talked about it himself, how like he understands that the fans have doubted him and stuff like that shouldn't be in his mindset. He should have been coming in thinking, I'm going to improve this group. But he almost seems a little bit apologetic yeah. about the fact he's here. And not to disparage the guy, because I'm sure he's a good guy. He works hard and there's things he is good at, like Dan mentioned. But with a player like Vifer, whether he's got the ceiling or not of others, it's it's hard to know. I would say it's certainly a, a, a straighter line for him to reach his ceiling than it is for, say, a Gravenberg to reach his. Because even though Gravenberg's will be a lot higher, I think there's a far higher chance of Vifa reaching his potential. So I just I just shared in the chat, Gags, I just shared the, um, the, the scouting profile from FB Ref on Vifa. Now, the reason that I shared this with you is because it's very rare to see the player, well, the defensive, which is the bottom section, versus the the attacking, which is the top two sections. Because if you are on a good team in a dominant league, right, you would expect to see big bars on the progression and anything to do with passing, yeah, because you're on a dominant team, right. But at the same time, if you're on a dominant team, you don't expect to see big bars on the defensive attributes because you don't have much defending to do. Vifa has got the big bars with the tackles, mm. the interceptions, the blocks, the clearances, and the aerials. Alongside the big big numbers for being, is there a tax though? There will be a tax, of course. There always, there's always a divisi tax, but mm. um, but certain I, things will. For the price you're paying, regardless. for the price you're paying, it's it, it's a, it's a, it's 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 well worth it for a yeah. for, for just to get us by because obviously, you know, nothing standing out at the moment that's available, and in the summer you he, can go big for someone instead. So he looks but, better, he, he looks a better bet than Endo, who we signed as our stat cup. So you could say after after tw- after tw- after twelve months, you could say we'd look to sell him. Yeah. On and we have Viva's coming, Viva's coming in the team. Um, yeah, I mean his price is is such a twenty million that there's a there's a rumor, and I don't know how much more than that it is, but there's a rumor that Bubakar Kamara has a buyout clause in his contract that kicks in in the summer of 2024 if they don't make the Champions League. But signing a V for now wouldn't rule out the fact that you could go and get Kamara if the buyout was 40 especially, especially if you move Endo on. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because you're opening up then another spot. So then you'd have the two of them and both, well, Kamara has that great versatility. So if you need to pop him here, there or anywhere you can and you have Viva to come in, you also don't need to worry about one of them getting injured because you've got the other. In certain games, you could throw them out there together because... Kamara could fill that old Ginny Wijnaldum sort of second number six role if you wanted to go and defend a lead in a European game or whatever. 
if you wanted to go to the Etihad and bank in and, and try and hit them on the counter, you could do that. So I I would say I would go for V for to be honest, I would go for V for and I would go for Mascardo because I think that just locks that position up for us for the long term. I think Mascardo will overtake him in a couple of years. And then if V is comfortable staying in a backup role, great. If he's not, you'll you'll guarantee to make money on I, him. I guess I'll say on, on, on Moscardo, right? On his data profile gags, um he he's got nothing on the top. No goals, no assists, virtually he's virtually zero. The defect the bottom ones, tackles interception, but the full 95, 99%. <laughs> just, so he's a monster pretty, defense. It's pretty clear what type of player he is. <laughs> yeah, in he's terms a of monster defense, but, but he is comfortable on the ball. He just doesn't yeah. he doesn't venture into the final. Yeah, third. yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So he's That's for other people to do. The, the only one I'd say about on Fernandez to uh, do you just to Dave's benefit is that his second most similar on his data profile yeah. is Ugarte, and yeah. so I know how much Dave loved Ugarte. So we didn't get him because he went to PSG, didn't he? So, if, but yeah, if, that's if, if PSG buy Mascardo as they're rumored to be looking, we should throw in a bid for Ugarte in the summer. Defo. Yeah. Defo. Why not? Like, can, can the finance guy mention the elephant in the room though? Um, yes. which is the fact that um, our current right back has expressed a strong desire to move into the centre of the park and whether, if that is accommodated, whether that has any bearing on a decision about who we sign for the DM role. I would suggest that if Trent moves into midfield, we're moving to a midfield four with a back four and a front two. And the person that drops out will be whoever the left winger is be it Diaz, be it Jota, be it Gakpo. I think that's that's what would happen. We'd go to a box midfield of Trent plus DM, as it is now, the same midfield setup where the two eights basically play as tens when we have the ball, but they play even wider when we don't. Think 99-2000 Lazio with Stankovic and Nedved, or think, you know, any of those great box midfield teams over the years where you know, Saki's Milan... Where you know you've got Donadoni and Colombo, yeah, Colombo playing wide and playing central when we have the ball, and we just sign another fullback, and I, th- I don't think it affects the defensive midfield. You, like Trent is not going to impact the defensive midfield player because Trent gets dribbled past endlessly and isn't good enough defensively in that type of situation to warrant playing him as the defensive midfielder, for example. And you couldn't play Trent, Alexis and, and Dominic. It would be absolute suicide as, okay. as a three. Cur- Curtis is there now. And when people moan about Curtis, Curtis is there now because he's the best defensive player out of the four. He might not have the numbers of Dominic or Alexis, but he's the one that fills space, blocks passing lanes, yeah. doubles up on players. Like, yeah. Even in, in, against City at the weekend, when he didn't have a good game defensively, Curtis was very good, and Curtis was a big part of the reason that Doku wasn't coming in field nonstop because he was getting back over to double up with Trent. We switched Curtis and Dominic because Dominic wasn't doing a good enough job at helping Trent. Curtis switched over, and Doku was out of the game for fifteen minutes. Yeah, he was. He did go quiet for a bit. Um, I think I think I think the the, the thing is um, if 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 uh, most comfortable with that this deal is the right the, this is makeable deal and it's a decent price, it, the, the, it's not a, it's not a huge gamble in that respect. Um, yeah, even and he's, if, he's even only if, and he's if, only twenty he's only twenty four. Yeah, even if Trent did move into midfield, it's not a yeah. It's endo goes and then we still have a backup if need be. I, I just um, think he if he's available now as well, Mo. Do you think he's available in January? Do you think he's is it an attainable deal? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, um, it does give you the options for the second half of the season then, and it, and it, it does look like an upgrade on Endo to me. Oh, big time. Mm. Okay, well, we know what we want to do there. Um, so are we going to go for Moscato as a project then as well, or Archie, or Archie Gray? Um, see if we have the money at the end, maybe. Yeah, yeah. If we have the money for a second midfielder, we get a second midfielder. If we don't, we should have. We should have, but... Yeah, well, um, let's let's see. Let's see. Let's go left back, Dave. Right, left back. So we're looking at kind of left back, left side, centre back profiles. Um, a Premier League example would be a Nathan Aki, a Josko Gvardiol type who can play left back out of possession, defend as a left back. But when we have the ball, can either slide in as a centre back or be progressive going forward. 
So I've got a list of six um, that I've put together here. Uh, the first one is a player who's been linked to us over the summer, and that's Goncalo Inacio of Sporting, uh, 22 years of age. He has been developed in a back three at Sporting, but he's played right side and left side as well as in the middle and on the odd occasion. He has played some games as a traditional left back. He's six one. He's quick. He's very smooth in possession. He's a tremendous passer of the ball. Quite an ambitious player as well in terms of what he's trying to do when he has the ball. He doesn't just want to settle for the easiest thing. I'm fairly certain he's played one or two games in midfield under under Ruben Amram, but that might have been in play. Like during a game, he might have moved into that position rather than starting there. Um I think he'd be a really good fit. Now, he would be quite pricey, but Portuguese international, five caps already and, and a big, big future. Uh, the next one then is Piero Hincapié, another player that's been linked to us in the past. Six foot, tough, strong, quick. Probably the ideal fit for the role because he's played centre back in a four, left back in a four, left side in a three, middle in a three, He's played defensive midfield and he's played left wing back. So he kind of ticks all your boxes. He can be a little bit rash with some of the decisions that he makes defensively. Um, A little bit kind of Christian Romero-esque in terms of sometimes he might get wound up by something that's happened somewhere else and just go in a little bit too hard on a tackle almost to make a point. But he is a very, very good player. Uh, Arthur Tiete of Wren. 6-1, Belgian international, 13 caps. He's 23 years of age. He's got the most experience playing left back and centre back in a four. Um, He's been at Rennes now for over a year and he's been very, very impressive in that team. Jorge Cuenca, um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, of Villarreal. Not a huge amount of experience in the top flight, though he did play a season with Almeria a few years ago. He came through the Barcelona Academy. He is very, very strong defensively. He's 6'3". He, coming through their academy, was tagged as the next Puyol in terms of how he plays and the the attitude which he plays. He's, unlike the others, he's more, I'd say he's stronger defensively than the others, not quite as good on the ball. So it would depend what you want. But he does have ideal centre-back size. So you could play him in the centre-back role instead of Virgil if Virgil needed a game off. Um, 24 years of age, so he is the oldest on the list as well. And he's a little bit of a slow, a slower developer. He sort of hit a hit a brick wall when he was in Barca's academy and Barca gave up on him. But he's, he's rerouted himself since going to Villarreal and had a couple of good loans with Almeria and Hitafe. And he's now looking quite good for for Villarreal. And the last one then is probably the unknown of the group. It's Lucas Baraldo uh, of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's the youngest on the list. He's 20. So he wouldn't count as homegrown or as as non-homegrown rather. Um, 6-1, very, very good in the ball. Quick, aggressive defender, but very composed. Doesn't lose his head. Doesn't make rash decisions. Um, he's had a really good season in what's not a great Sao Paulo team. He's the he does stand out in that team quite a bit. Um, I think he'd fit fit the role quite well. I think they all fit well. Kuank is probably the most centre backy of the lot. Tiete and Hincapié probably the best in terms of being a left back. But if it's a three, Baraldo and Anasio are just tailor made for it. Okay, the numbers, Dan, please. Did, did you miss the the last one on the list? I um, did, I okay. did. I missed one. Uh, Jarrell Hato of Ajax, only 17. Now, from a ceiling point of view, it's, it's him with a bullet point. He is a super talented young player, six foot, a little bit slight, but he'll fill out as he gets older. But he's already played uh, 36 games for the Ajax first team or 33 games for the Ajax first team. So 
plenty of experience already at 17 and not a huge amount, obviously, but for a 17 year old, it's a lot of experience. It's unusual to see a center back getting into any team as early as he did. He's also played quite a bit as a left back, but he fits well in, in either, um, in either spot. And like he's a 2006 birth. If any of us want to feel really, really old. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, (laughs) Go on then, Dom. (laughs) You need it. Yeah, so um, this is a bit of a redux, actually, Gax, because two of these players made the shortlist in the summer. Um, And I was really pushing for Piero Hincapi back then, um, but we ended up assigning Mickey van der Ven, um, who's actually gone on to be um, um, a real success for Tottenham before he got injured. Um, So, yeah. Um, but Hincapi, I did look at it and I thought, hang on, his numbers haven't re- his numbers have barely changed since the summer. What's going on there then? Is he injured? Uh, no, he's not injured, but it looks like to me, Dave, as far as I can make out, he started the season with su- suspended and then basically because Leibacusian have been doing pretty damn well, uh, this season, he's basically had to wait his time to come in and he's just basically been in the Europa League and he's only really just got back in the team. Is that yeah. is that pretty much how it's been? Yeah, I mean, they they started off like a house on fire. The fire has not extinguished at all. They've been remarkably good this season under uh, potentially the next Liverpool manager, Xabi Alonso. Yes. Um, and, and he <clears> was <throat> just, he was sticking with the guy with the hot hand. He was sticking with the guys yeah. who were playing really well from... There was a suspension or an injury. Hincapié got in and Alonso just stuck with the same thing. You got in, you played really well, you're going to stay in. And that's just how it's going to be. I'm not going to go back to the guy that had the jersey just because he had it. He lost it. Might not have been his fault, but he lost it and now he's out. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa. He does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable, there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter, at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, yeah, Hincapi. Um, Very refreshing. Yeah. Very refreshing indeed. So... Lots to like about him still, as Dave said, very quick. 1v1, he is very good. Um, I believe the links came, maybe Mo couldn't elaborate, but after the Caicedo ones, he's maybe represented by the same people and they maybe started offering to us as a, as a sop for missing out. I don't know. Uh, who knows? But uh, Hinka P, yes, absolutely, we would push for that. Um, you know, because he's, he's six foot as well. He's not... Um, you know, he's not he, he's not going to look out of place in the Premier League in that role. Inacio was also on the list, um, and his in his story remains the same as well. Very very good uh, passer, um, particularly an excellent injury history. Again, nothing there. Um, he's the best passer. He, you know, so there's there's it's, there's the same qualities as we had before um, with those two players as we did last time. And on Hato. The most interesting thing to know about Hato is, um, while well, he's he's got two thousand one hundred career minutes, and it's a it's a data decision, it's a scouting decision, not a data decision. His most similar player on his profile is Inacio, in terms of so the profile of those two players, Hato and Inacio, is very very similar. So onto the onto the newcomers, we'll just look at in more detail. Uh, Theate, he 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 looks really interesting um, because he's. As Dave said, he, he he's actually played centre back and he's actually played left back, and we do we do need to think about centre back replacements as well as pure centre back skags, don't we? We know we know this, we know we need to future proof, you know, in that position as well as talking about hybrid role. Um, and he's he's six foot three, uh, eighty one kilos, so that is not he's not going to look out of place in the Premier League with that kind of physicality. Um, he's got a good injury history. 
Um, he's only got one game I can see missed ever through injury, uh, age 23. Um, and yes, he looks like he's got centre-back attributes. He's moderate in the air for his size. He's not elite. Um, that might be the only thing uh, we should think, well, a 6 3 player should be dominant in the air, but he doesn't show that um, in the data. And moderate 1v1. But he's outstanding at carrying and passing in a, in a not particularly dominant Rennes team. Rennes are, what, mid-table, Dave? Mid-table team in France? Yeah, I mean, uh, Ligue 1 has been bizarre this season with teams that finished in the Champions League spots last season um, kind of struggling a bit. But uh, Rennes this season are 10th in the league as things stand. Yeah, and to, to have such dominant passing numbers and carrying numbers for a, for a guy who plays centre-back and left back in a, in a moderate team. That's really interesting. Um, and he does have some actual goals. I think he's chipped in with a few from set plays as, as well, which is nice. Um, so his progressive passes is good. His carrying is good as well. And um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like there for a 23 year old. Um, and as, and as Dave actually said, George Cuenca or Jorge Cuenca, yeah, he he he's definitely a for me. He's definitely a centre back rather than a full back here. His passing and his his carries are his weak points. Where he is very very good one v one in terms of one v one defender, and he's strong in the air too. Um, but again, another player with a good injury history. All these four players, Ignacio, Hincapi, Fiate, and Cuenca, have all got excellent injury history. Um, so yeah, it depends. He looks like, a, but he looks like a pure centre back um, on the data. Doesn't look like he could play the hybrid role in that way, um, in terms of because he may not have anything going forward. But Hincapi, Fiate, possibly an SEO, depending if you want to pass her first and foremost. Um, and then the two, um, and then and the two scouting picks would be up to you guys, Beraldo um, and Hato, the teenagers. Yeah. Sounds good, Mo. Numbers uh, in terms of prices for these players. Okay, so um, firstly, if we start with Anasio, um he has a 60 million euro release clause uh, based on his most recent contract, uh, which equates to about 52 million pounds. And as Dave mentioned um, just earlier on, um, Port- uh, Portuguese clubs uh, generally do tend to Look for the buyer for the uh, sorry the release clause to be triggered um, if they sell in January. So that's the amount we'd be looking at for him if we try to sign him um, in January. Um, Hincapi um, is also valued at the same amount. Um, he also has a release clause as well, reportedly um, of sixty million euros or fifty-two million pounds, and um, just. Um, Touching on the point that was made by Dan relating to his agent, yes, he is the same agent that represented um, Caicedo. Um, and we all know, obviously, how that turned out. That said, um, I believe that we are we have a reasonable relationship with the agent, despite some reports that suggested that you know we, we were disappointed in how he handled the situation. Uh, apparently, those to quote uh, James Pierce, uh, reports were wider than Mark. And in fact, um, it was more the player having decided that Chelsea is the club that he wanted to move to. Um, that was a determining factor, not the agent trying to um, extract maximum value from any of the two Sally, uh, uh, interested clubs, either Liverpool or Chelsea. the cow dung off that statement by Jimbo. <laughs> the big bag of money the agent got is the reason he went to Chelsea. The player had very little say in it. Surely the length of the contracts as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the player. The, the Seven, eight with, years, was it? Eight years. Eight year contract. The thing with, with that as well is it's it's known that the player owed the agent quite a significant sum of money because the agent had been basically paying for everything for a couple of years while he was earning peanuts. And he was basically at the whim of what the the agent wanted and the agent was given the the large bag of money by we have we have we have heard in the grapevine that um Incapi is being offered though as a yeah, as a as, as a, a sorry kind of, yeah that agent is a dreadful gang of lads though so might be one to avoid <laughs> oh but he the is. player the player is well worth getting the player well is. exactly i think they th- i think there's something there where 
you know, you lose out on someone, but you gain a position where you're kind of covering. If, if, two if, if, if business one, is, you know? business is business, gags, as you always say. I completely agree. And if anything, you know, what Survivor Series teaches us, business is business for sure. <laughs> Sorry well, to get that reference in. Yeah. This is business. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the player is represented by Manuel Serra, who represented Caicedo in the summer. Um, that by no means uh, rules out any deal for the player. Um, and uh, moving on, uh, Chate is a player that's valued significantly less at uh, £30 million. He ha- also, like the other two players, has a contract that extends through till uh, June 2027. Um, so good... Uh, Know, three and a half years left on that deal, um, but nonetheless, significantly lesser transfer fee um, involved there. And also, um, he's a player that um, will be on less wages than um, the other two. So potentially, he would be coming in on a lesser wage um, compared to either a Hincapi or an Asio. Um, Cuenca is a player that um, also. Um, would be available for a much lesser uh, fee. Um, so I valued uh, that deal at £20 million in terms of the fee uh, for that player. Uh, Baraldo is a player who I value even lesser than that, which is at £15 million. Um, again, Sao Paulo is not a club that historically uh, commands um, huge transfer fees for um, their prized assets and uh so I think that amount would be enough to tempt them to sell. Um, and then finally, Hato is a player that I value at um, £10 million. Pounds. Um, though he has obviously considerable potential, um, he's also a player whose contract um, ends in just over 18 months' time. So really, um, either this window or the summer is a point at which... Um, Ajax really need to look to extract maximum value, but I would argue that it's really when the player has 18 months left that they can command the most for the player. So I think £10 million would certainly be enough to tempt um, Ajax to sell. Okay. Um, So after that, recommendations then, guys. Overall, what we would want to do. I mean... Gags, just on the um um the, the two players that Fiate and Hinkipi, um I, I guess put it into the into the group for you to see um the stories that they have on their data in terms of their data profile, who they're most similar to. So um Fiates are all ball playing centre backs, uh, Joel and Carriers, Joel Matip, Matthias De Lick, Lewis Dunk under um and, and, and at Brighton and and Raphael Varane, um, so you can see the type of players there that the Ate is closest to profile into. And um, Hincapi on his top ten list are Bastoni, uh, Nacho at Real Madrid, uh, Ibu at, at Liverpool, and Levi Colwell at Chelsea. So you, you, yeah, I think I think that sort of tells a nice little story about the types of defenders both of them are. And I think it shows you how how strong Fiate is in his in his carrying and his and his and his passing. Yeah, it depends on what we're looking for uh, in terms of how we're. Are playing. we looking for a matic replacement? Yes, I think we are looking for a matic replacement as well. But he's I would say plays, though, he plays he plays right side though, right? Matip mm, to Virgin. Mm. We cannot. I think I think the matic replacement we can look for in the summer. Yeah, like. The thing we're really looking for now is more an, an Andy Robertson upgrade, like to fit the system and also oh for the long yeah. term. And if if we're going to go back to a traditional back four at some point, Hincapier is probably the better fit. If we thought we were going to play a long term back three, Tiete is probably the better fit. Inacio's really good for either. I would say they're the three we should be kind of looking at I agree mm. yeah I don't think long term we're going to a back three I think um, it'll be this system or a four you know at the end of the day so I think maybe Hincapi does 
you know. I've got a question for Dave. Um, so if we do perhaps um, stick with a traditional back four, um, Ait Nuri from Wolves, who we've talked about on here three years ago, mm. um, w- would you be tempted to go for him above any of these left centre back type players? In a traditional back four, yes. Like in a traditional back four, definitely. I, I think I think Aitnery's potential is sky high. The only slight concern I have about him is he does seem a little bit prone to some like niggly muscular injuries that keep him out for a game here, a game there. But yeah, I, I would I would go for him over if we were doing a list of left backs, he would be very high on that list, and like we'd be talking about like Purvis Estupinan and players like that as well it's just we kind of have to buy for how we're playing right now and right now that role is kind of a combination of left side center back left back and a little bit of left wing and the one that does fit that the best is Piero Hincapié he is the one that fits best into how we play at this minute what we're asking Robbo and Costas to do when they play that position Incapier is the one that fits best into that. Yeah. He he is only 21 mm. as well. So um, it doesn't count as non-homegrown for this season. No. Um, but will but they are challenging Labour Cruz are challenging for the Bundesliga, aren't they? Yeah. So they might not be willing to sell, which I think obviously now <clears throat> I think in the summer there was talk that the price was going to be like 35, but obviously Moe's ad- ad- is is uh, adapting that for where they are now. So it might be the thing that if you get to the summer with Incapia, you could get him a bit cheaper. Now I think you would pay that premium. I think you're paying fifty to fifty-five for him. Yeah, yeah. I think I think with Robbo just coming back in Jan, we may just go. Well, guys, I mean, ten weeks, you know, and then it's yeah, plus recovery. It's not yeah, yeah, it might be a bit longer. But he yeah, did but- say he did say it's, it's healing well. To be, yeah. to be fair, so um, Le- Leverkusen are top of the Bundesliga mm. by two points from Bayern, yeah, and, so and they're unbeaten and, and they've won their Europa League group as well. Now it was a really, really weak Europa League group, but they're unbeaten in that. They're unbeaten in the domestic cup. Again, they've played lower league teams, but they're unbeaten across three competitions this season. Jesus, wow. and th- they're playing like gorgeous football. Might be more than <laughs> might be more that we have to play to get him out. Maybe, they, maybe, maybe we go Theati then, you know, if we're looking to get someone well, in, definitely. I, I mean, are we desperate you, to get you, someone you, in? You, you can say, right, that um, he, okay, he's only playing for a middle table French t- trench side, but his his numbers are good for somebody who's playing in a not dominant team. Mm. And, you know, if if, he, if if you've got Matthias De Ligt and Joel Matip on your, on your data profile, that's, that's, that's not too, that's not, that, that tells you what you're going to get. Yeah, on the left side, which is great, which is fine. Yeah, the only thing—the other, th- the only thing—is it's it is Virgil's position, you know, unless Virgil moves to a more central role. No, yeah. but he's, if, if but you're bringing he's... him in, he's starting left back, but we're we're being a lot more solid defensively when we have the ball. We're keeping yeah. a three, yeah, and and that left back isn't been told. <clears throat> now, whether they're told or not, or whether they're just a little bit like dogs chasing a car and they just think they have to get forward, I don't know because. Costas and Robbo do play that position differently. Robbo definitely plays it more like a a dog place chasing a car. A little bit there's a little bit of Albi Moreno starting to show its head in Robbo at times. Um Costas is a little bit more reserved, but then Costas is less dynamic than Robbo as well. So maybe he doesn't trust his recovery pace the yeah. way Robbo trusts his. Um the other thing with 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 Tiete, he plays for the Belgian national team, who are a dominant team. And he mm. looks very comfortable and very at home in that setup as well. So he's he's shown that ability to adapt to a team that does dominate the ball, which would, I think, would speak well for him in moving into a team like our own. Okay, let's let's go let's go uh, theatre because it just seems I don't think it's going to be possible to get in Capri. Uh, but but we can decide at the end. We can just say that's the player we choose. But do we go with it or not? Uh, well, theatre looks like a make it looks like a makeable deal. Yeah, and also we got to think about what we're doing with non-homegrown stuff uh, at the mm. end. So let's put him on the list. 
um, we'll get to the end and we'll we'll make some decisions on what we can do and what we can't. It's not about money anymore. It's about squad yeah. and what we do and who we can get rid of um, as well. So, so Dave, let's go to the right backs then, the final position. Yeah. So um, I've got five on this list. Uh, the first one <clears throat> back to Ajax again for Divine Wrench, uh, who's just a really good all round right back. He's good on the ball. He's comfortable getting forward. He adds some value in the final third. Defensively, he's really strong. And I've seen him get put on decent wingers and lock them down and t- keep them out of the game. He's been capped by the Netherlands, though he hasn't been getting recent call-ups to the senior team. He's back in the other 21s, but he is only 20 years of age. Um, again, he'd just fit into the, the Dutch group. And sticking with the Dutch um, team, uh, one player that we spoke about for last summer, Lucherelle Gertrude of also a Feyenoord, uh, 23 years of age. And he's got great versatility, can play right back, can play centre back, can also play as a holding midfielder. So from a squad point of view, he might make a lot of sense. I think he's got a lower ceiling than Wrench. He is three years older as well. Uh, Arnaud Martinez of Girona. He is playing outstanding football. They're playing incredibly well. They're the surprise package of Europe this season. Um, Only 20 years of age, already passed 100 senior games for Girona. Six foot, strong, can play centre back or right back. He's, I'd tag him as sort of a Branislav Ivanovic type of right back. And I think that's kind of what he will develop into potentially a better version of Ivanovic, but that's sort of, you know, defense first, but like a tall, aerially dominant fullback. He'll have to work on that side, but I think he can become that player. Um, Killian Sildilia is one that I, I just come to really like playing for Freiburg. And that they're a fun side to watch and they're a really nice club to keep an eye on well-run, good manager, you know, they do things the right way. They're basically the Brentford or Brighton, probably more Brentford stylistically, of the Bundesliga, you know, punching Mm. above their weight and, you know, finding good value on the margins. They've had the same manager at Christian Strike for a long, long time. He does a really good job, but he's turned down a lot of bigger clubs. And and like with Thomas Frank, he gets buy-in from his players and, this season in particular, I've seen Sildilia just seems to have taken on a new level to his game. Um, I think he's a really good player, really good one to keep an eye on. And then the last one, I went with more of an attack-minded player because I wasn't sure which type of right back you want. For me, I'd like a more defensive one. I'd like us to be a bit stronger defensively if we're going to play a four with Trent in midfield in a four and two up front. I would like us to just have that really solid defensive base. Um, But I I did go with one really attack-minded version, which is Vanderson, the young Brazilian, 22 at uh, Monaco. He first came on the radar a couple of years ago when he joined Monaco. And the main reason he did was because the team that they beat to get him was Brentford. And I always like to keep an eye on who Brentford and Brighton are looking at because really smart teams are worth tracking because they make good decisions and they buy players to develop and sell. And they would have been looking to buy Vanderson to develop him and sell him to a club like us or City or Arsenal or Spurs or Chelsea. So I've been keeping an eye on him since he went to, to Monaco. Defensively, there's a few ricks that I'd like to see him work out. He does deal fairly well with pacey players, though, which is a positive sign. He's got good lateral movement. He's very quick at changing directions as well. He's really good going forward. He's a very fun player going forward. Good on the overlap, can cut in field as well, and link with players. I think if you asked him to, he could do this Trent role that he's doing now. So I think that's a positive as well. Um, I did leave Jeremy Frimpong off this list because whatever chance there is of getting Hincapié out of there right now, there is zero chance that they will even consider a Jeremy Frimpong sale at the moment. Because right now, 
There is no right back or right wing back in Europe who can hold a candle to what he's doing. He has been ridiculous in this 3-4-3 that Alonso's playing. So Vanderson is on our list, but Frimpong is not, if people are wondering why. Okay, Darth, some numbers. Yeah, and again, another redox here, Gags, with two 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 players from um from the summers list um still on it, which is nice con- good continuity there. I mean, uh, Vanderson, younger brother of Milderson, um yeah, it's still like Dave said, all the same attributes he had. Um and you know, he we discussed him at length in the summer. Um and I think he he, he looks he looks decent. Wait, wait, Milderson's a real player. Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Sorry, mate. <laughs> I was here chuckling my head off. Oh no. Okay. I think there actually was a player back in the day called Milderson, actually, in the eighties. But yeah. It's anyway. been like a it's been like three, four months since we mentioned them, you I know. know? Just, Isn't it just... been great? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to come oh, and just make the joke because it's so funny. That was very oh, good. Brilliant. Okay. Very good. Um, but the question, yeah, the, the question is with Dave is, he, yeah, he, he's definitely on the up and he's definitely got attacking option. But is that is that what we want now? I don't know. Is is he is he does he take the one of the homegrown spots? You know, I'm not sure. But if you go back to a back four with a conventional right back who was attacking, yeah, then he could be he could be a good one. The other one from the summer was Gertrude, Um and pretty much what we said then was his he it's only he's he only got the ear of his data to fall back on. And he's another one now who's now got the Champions League campaign from this from this autumn to fall back on. And again, just like FIFA, um he's proven to be a pretty pretty capable player. In, in the Champions League and he is six foot. He's he's twenty three years old. Um and he's and he's definitely improved some of the things that you had questions about when you're looking at the pure ear divisi data because he's he's no question that he can play in a pressing system because that's what he he does with his manager. Um he, he there's no question he plays a lot of continuity and build up and he even even inverted to 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 some degree uh, or quite a large degree actually. Um and the questions were more about his off the ball stuff, and and he and he he his data his volume of dirty of the dirty side of the game gags has beefed up a bit this season. And one thing that does remain high though is is when he actually does get involved in one v one duels, his win rate is extremely high, which is always a good thing. If you can if if you can actually withstand players who are dribbling at you, that that's a good trait to have. Um, and Gertrude does does seem to have that. One, even if he doesn't actually make that many tackles and you know go and do any many duels himself, um, but yeah, on the ball, yeah, his he 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 basically profiles like um, a Trent dominant level player in terms of his passing and his creativity in the equipment. Obviously, eight of his attacks, yeah, and stuff, but but useful depends on the price. Um, his most sim- he he includes Julian Timber, the guy who went to Arsenal. Um, and got injured in the first game. And Inacio on his profile, it tells you what he, what he's like with the ball. Um, Wrench, um, yet another, as I said, Dave said, another, yet another um, Edivisi product. Um, yeah, and it's um, it's it's much more moderate compared to compared to Gertrude. This this he, this he looks like a a, a reserve player. Uh, he looks like you know somebody who who you pick up. Um, in an emergency, that there is not very much going uh, going forward in terms of the carries, the take ons, on the production from him. Uh, but he again, he's only twenty, three years younger than Gertrude. Uh, Martinez, um, completely different style of play, of defender, as Dave said. Um, interesting that the Branislav Ivanovic, who was a, he was a, he was a bit of a tank back in the day, and um, Martinez's most similar profile is another tank of a player, Luke Shaw. Believe it or not, um, yeah. So uh, that that's interesting. I mean, obviously, that doesn't take into account. It's just, that's just purely a coincidence. But he do he is a lot more physical than the other players, um, and he's very much a well, he, he's very much, looks like an all rounder in terms of a fullback. Um, so he he definitely looks to be worth a shout. I mean, he's only twenty, and he's and he's virtually six foot, whisker under six foot. So 
that he he definitely looks like he's worth a look at gags um and Cedilia, um yeah this is the definition of a uh, of a left field choice and again similar to um wrench um there's some there's some definitely some interesting features in him but he he is i i think personally it's a Gertrude or Martinez um possibly Vanderson but yeah and Cedilia and Bench look like bargain options if we need to um, proceed that way. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Okay, Mo? Okay, so um, let's start with uh, let's start with Wrench. Then um, he is a player uh, that I value at fifteen million pounds. Um, IX obviously have sold players um, over the years for considerably more than that, but um, not at the moment seen as one of their star players as such and so therefore I think £15 million would be about right to secure him um, Gertruda um, valued higher and more experienced um, for a start um, but also um, he is represented by Wasserman who are one of the big um, agencies and absolute juggernaut so um, when they are involved in deal um, there is often a bit of a premium there, um, partly because it helps them to secure um, a, a greater commission. Um, and the agent's fees as well would be considerable compared to the other players on, on this particular list. Um, Martinez um, is an interesting one. Um, I value him at uh, £20 million. Sorry, I should say Gertruda, um, I value at £25 million. Uh, Martinez at £20 million. Pounds. Now, he does play for Girona. Um, and with Girona, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but um, they are part of City Football Group, are they not? They are. So for now, uh, because at the moment they're they're second in the La Liga table, and if they were to make the Champions League, Manchester City football, the City Football Group would be forced to sell them or sell Manchester City. Yes, um, and and by sell, it, it might be a similar kind of. RB Salts, uh, well, Red Bull Salzburg, RB Leipzig type arrangement, possibly, but uh, certainly for the time being, um, I think that is one potential showstopper where that deal is concerned. In that, um, you know, City Football Group, um, not much love lost when it comes to Liverpool Football Club, where those people are concerned. So that would be my only concern. It's not to say that they wouldn't sell under any circumstances from one of their. Um, other clubs um, but at the same time you know we, we haven't really signed any other players from the City Football Group um, since that multi-club model has been set up um, some 10 years or so ago moving on though um, we have uh, Sildilia who um, I value at £20 million and uh, finally finally uh, Vanderson um, 
from Monaco, I value at twenty five million pounds. Okay. Thank you. Um so guys, what's the what's the which way are we going on this one? I, I think Dan is right. I think it is either Gertruda or um Martinez. <clears throat> What stands out for me is I I would like a right back that doesn't get beat very often for a change. After a what, while, what what do you, what do you think of uh, Gertrude in the, the, the in his Champions League campaign game? Do you think you know because he is very he is very good going forward. He's very good on the ball. What do you, what do you think about when you watched him in the scouting wise defensively? I think he's solid. I think he does make more mistakes than than Martinez does. I think he, he's prone to the odd laps in concentration. Um, the other factor as well is if we're buying Vifa from Feyenoord, are oh, they yeah. going to be willing to sell both of them? <laughs> yeah, that's a good So point. that could make it tough. Obviously, Mo, Mo was right that buying from, from a City football group team could be a little bit difficult as well. But, I mean, I think there, Girona and City know that he is going to leave. He has never been linked with a move to City. Um, Barcelona has been linked a few times, but he's never been linked to the move to City. I think I'd be inclined to go for Martinez for a couple of reasons. I think he is stronger defensively. I think the upside is higher. He's three years younger. He wouldn't take up a non-homegrown spot this year or Or next year. No, or next year. Yeah. So that, to me, with the price being around the same... That, to me, would be a big selling point. Now, Gertrude does have a bit more versatility about him. And as Dan mentioned, he's done that inversion thing. So if you were just looking for him to come in and be Trent's cover, he can do that. He can play right back. He can play in the midfield. He's not a, a Trent-level passer, but, I mean, there's about four players in the world that are. Yeah, he's not bad, though. He's not, but he's not a bad passer at all. Martinez is, is good on the ball for a fullback. Like a normal full pack, not like the the mutants that we've seen come along in the last few years. Martinez is pro- is better defensively. Gertrude is better going forward. Hey, Gags, the, the consequence of doing the deal uh, with for Martinez might be that you have to vote the way the city want you to vote in a couple of Premier League board meetings. <laughs> we do generally vote with them on a lot of stuff anyway, though, because the yeah. big six does tend to yeah. vote as a block. Yeah. Now, at the same time, there'll be certain things they might want us to vote on that we definitely want to vote with them. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, that, that could be it. Or, you know, they might just make you pay a little bit more. But the thing with City is, there's an arrogance with Manchester City where they look at their rivals and think, you're not really rivals. Like, you might think you are, you're not really. They sold Zinchenko and Gabriel Jesus to Arsenal, who they've had bad relations with over the years. They sold Raheem Sterling to Chelsea, who they've had bad relations with over the years. I I think it would be easier to do Martinez from Girona. It's not like we're buying him directly from City, like where their fans might kick off. We sold Raheem to them at the at the end of the day. Like there has been times where the clubs have gotten on quite well off the pitch. And I mean, for all the rivalry on the pitch, Jurgen and Guardiola have of some weird bromance. It's, this is not like it's like it's not like it's Ferguson and Wenger. This is not you know 90, 96, 97 to oh three oh four no. Arsenal Manchester United levels of rivalry. It's quite civil for the most part. There's a few things we disagree on. They're cheating, obviously, been the primary one. Yeah. But I do think the relationship is is fairly amicable. Yeah. Let's do that then. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, I think certainly when it comes to players and coaches, um, you know, there is to a degree mutual respect. Um, I think when it comes to club management, um, I, I think there's a lot more bitterness there. Uh, if you've read some of the kind of commentary around, you know, some of the feelings around I mean let, let's not but forget but the bitterness uh, Mo comes from us forget, towards them not is, them towards us 
Yeah, but let, let's not forget some, some of Dan's mates. D- d- didn't they hack? Uh, oh yeah, that was, no. But the, the like, thing is, we didn't. We didn't, we didn't, they didn't hack it. No, no, no. They didn't. They, they just. They, they just had rubbish data retention policies after some of their staff left. They didn't revoke their of, access to the we, system. We had staff that worked for City who yeah. joined us, who used their own logins that were existing logins on a certain site to yeah. access work that they had done. That yeah. work was done while contracting with the club. We self-reported on that. We told them, by the way, we've done this. Yeah, mm. this wasn't the city would never have known. As Gags, as Gags knows, any IT company worth its salt revokes access to systems when when staff leave. Oh, and it's it's city, city didn't, so that's their problem. And city would never have known if we hadn't self reported. So yeah. I have no sympathy. And like the thing is, that's we enough, offered so, to so pay them on, a million on, quid, on, and on. they were fine with it. Yeah, hold on. The the staff member that actually did the work themselves. On that account, just yeah. logged in to go and get the work that they'd done for another club. So they could have actually repeated the work. And let's not um, forget, that was also again, like nine years ago. Yeah, and look at, look at the shit players we were signing off the back of that data. <laughs> like Adam Lalana and Dejan Lovren and Paul Lambert. Uh, like if that's who we stole, they owe us a minute. If only it was Paul Lambert, Dave. If only if it was Paul Lambert. If Ricky oh, Lambert. Ricky Lambert. Lambert. <laughs> Paul Lambert was actually a good midfielder. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Back in the day. Dortmund, 97. Dortmund, 97, in one of the weirdest transfers that's ever happened where his contract ran out and he had no deal and he was meant to return back to Motherwell. And then he, and he went goes off to the on, European champions. Went yeah. off and had a try and won a European Cup. Good stuff. <laughs> okay, so Mart- Martinez, Martinez it is, yeah? I think we've got to try and make the deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mo, can, Mo can make that deal. So we're thinking Martinez... Theate, that's 50. And we're thinking um, we for 70 total million. Now, the problem is, uh, what's the ages of these? We for is 24. We for is 24, so he's Theate. a non homegrown. Theate yeah. is 23, so he's a non homegrown. Yep. Yep. And, yep. and Martinez what? is 20, so he doesn't count as non homegrown. So we could sell, well, we, this is the discussion we wanted to have. So we've got one spot, yeah. and we're going to. We're gonna we're gonna loan off Tiago to whoever will take a risk on him for six months. Loan him, sell him, whatever you have to do, move him yeah. on down the road. It might be a case that you have to loan him because he won't pass a medical. Yeah. If a club is trying to buy him, so well, well even you have to have medicals for loans or no? Not so much. No, no, not so much. They'll do like they might do a heart scan. They won't. Do there's, anything. there's got to be a Saudi deal that can be made in January. There's got to be. He could have one leg and they'd still sign him. So yeah, and then he, he a Saudi then, dealer does a bar, and then he then it's a team, and then he can say, "Oh, six months in Saudi, and then I'll just go for, to boss Barcelona next summer exactly. if he wants to do that." So well, exactly. I mean, so even even if he's even if he's sold for well, even if it's just a loan to Saudi, it's fine because you it's could send months. send him to Qatar to Al Arabi. He can play with his brother, which he's always True. wanted to do. So I don't put into his gags. I don't think it's unrealistic for Liverpool to say we're selling. Or loaning Thiago in January. No. I don't think that's unrealistic. Mm-hmm. No, because that might actually happen in real life. Yeah, yeah he yeah. hasn't, oh, he hasn't played, and realistically, he's not going to play. Like he's not going to play. He's going to come back. He might play twice. He'll get injured again. That hip injury is far worse than what's been publicly said. Like, there's been conversations about whether or not he should retire with that hip injury. So he's not coming back. And if he does come back. He's gone in six months. There is, there's more chance of one of the four of us lining out for Liverpool in the 24-25 season than there is of Thiago Alcantara getting a new contract. He's gone. Gags, up, He's gone. gags up front. It's the dream for me. Gags up centre forward. It's a dream. <laughs> like, a, like a young Carlos Tevez. Well, the good thing would be that if we did offload him to Saudi, they would almost certainly cover his full wages hmm. and his wages alone would be enough to pay the wages for the players that we've identified all three of them yeah that's the thing and we we should we should say that one of the homegrown the homegrown spot that is empty at the moment in real life is obviously going to be filled by Ryan Granberg next summer when he because he's no longer under 21 so there would have to be another homegrown exit in the summer, but that yeah. could, that could easily I, I, be. I think Joel Matip, Andy Robertson, 
Andy reserve Robertson. Go- reserve goalkeeper. Costa, yeah, Costa Simicus, Adrian. Yes. But that's, a, that's, that's an excellent problem, isn't it? It's an excellent problem. And I think it wouldn't be a big surprise if one of the, the non-Darwin or Mo attackers left. Yeah. Like if, if Jota decided he wanted a bigger role somewhere or we decided your injuries are just a little bit too much of a hassle, you're yeah. a really good player, but you're not available enough. Yeah. It wouldn't be a surprise if Luis Diaz yeah. turned around and said he wanted to go. There was talk in the summer that he would have liked to have gone to Saudi if we'd accepted the offer. So, wow. yeah. That there'll be there'll be op- options for us to create and like we said earlier, Endo might go, and that'll open up another yeah. spot. So there's definitely there's four or five potential. Um, like if we sign Tiete, for example, there's no real reason to keep Costa Simicus in the summer, or or Andy, one or the other of no. him or Robbo. You could sell both of them and go Tiete and like Luke Chambers and Callum Scanlon and Joe Gomez can fill in there. So we're fine. You you could do that, and you could move on both left backs. Maybe Henderson would like a, a you know a, another friend at El Etifak so that they can play in front of eight hundred people together. Um, so you know Robbo could go over there and 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 get you know a big payday if he wanted. Um, I'm sure Gerard would love to have him. Costas will have have interest from a couple of different places. Like there's a bunch of players in this squad. I think come the summer that will be. Just um, you know, we we we, we can move on from it and not worry too much about. So, but the point is, we can manage. We can bring these three in now. We can we can loan slash sell Thiago, mm. and then there's another there's a gap in the home ground, and then that's okay. That's, and yeah, we're in the we budget. At, then we look at the summer, and we you know, we should prioritize in the summer transfer window some some homegrown quality players if we can mm. Mm. as well. Well, like if we're if we're looking at the long term homegrown picture, there is definitely going to be options. But if you were to buy a Moscardo now, he would he have qualify long three years. Yeah, yeah, he'd have long enough. He he would qualify three years as homegrown is- when he when he comes of age. So Archie Gray obviously is homegrown. So there's 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 definite logic to maybe investing in in a Moscardo now. Rather than waiting for him to prove himself in Europe, and what and then was his price? He wasn't on the list, was he? Twenty, I think Mo said, fifteen so, or twenty. Uh, so fifteen could, for Moscardo. So we could so, we could fit him in. Yeah, well we on the could. Budget. Well, yeah, we're in the budget if we did that too. For the future, absolutely. So many other teams are doing it. You know, no. Even if you buy him and you loan him somewhere, for, <laughs> you buy him, bring him in for six months, loan him for next season. If you need to, if you if you just you, you've got to play three seasons between fifteen and twenty one to be homegrown. Yeah, so you've got to be you got to be loaned here. Yeah, so Moscardo would qualify if he yeah. came now. Yeah. So get him. The only the only slight um, potential challenge might be around the work permit. Because... They've, they've changed the rules. They've oh, changed they? the rules. He'll have no problem. You you can now sign. Yeah, it is a certain it's amount of. Problem, I think it's two players in in a. In an eighteen-month period or two players in a twenty-four-month period, without needing to go through the normal work permit rigmarole, yeah. So he he could be the one of your two, yeah. yeah. And and and, and they, re- they realize that they realize that the Brexit regulations aren't working, Dave. For some yeah. reason, crazy, isn't it? No. And the funny thing is, the Brexit regulations actually made it easier to sign these players because if they played like Copa Libertadores, that counted massively. Hmm. If they got one international cap rather than the old seventy-five percent rule, which was a scandal, Stupid. to be fair. Hmm. Hmm. And also, by the way, we haven't thought about uh, Tiago offloading would cover these wages, and we actually make a saving on wages. It yeah. would probably he would probably cover the wages of all players. Yeah. Well, no, it'd be, it would still make a saving, I think. On all four. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, V for fifty grand probably does him. Tiete probably similar, maybe sixty. I'd imagine Martinez maybe forty. Yeah, and way, yeah. Mascardo yeah. 20, twenty, yeah. twenty five. Yeah, we make some profit, man. Yeah, do you know Crazy. we would we'd, we'd save a bit of money, which and, and we'd have players. And look, we all love Thiago. Thiago is a far better footballer than, than any of the four players we're talking about here. Yeah, but these are players that could contribute, and yeah. we've talked about this for years: spending money on players that aren't actually contributing, or are contributing in a negative way. Like when we were paying James Milner the most money at the club to be one of the. Worst players at the club. Yeah. And and there's you know what? And Gravenberch is like um 
is like the example evidence of a player that even if they're not playing well somewhere else, when they come into this atmosphere, into this club, into the, into the, you know, you can the make way a contribution. They, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, because they, they feel loved. They feel like they're made, mm. you know, they're, they're valued and they feel like all the other team, the rest of the players are actually helping not rather than the politics, nonsense politics you get at a club, like say, for example, Man United, if he had gone to Man United, he'd be absolute dog shit. Yeah. And I think, I think all four of these players, I think they're all, Low risk, uh, with high upside potentially yeah. for for what yeah. for the deals that we're making here. These are the, these are breaking the bank deals. These are, these are mo- these are sensible investments with potential good upsides. It's it's mad that the culture is such a big part of the success. Yeah, credit yeah. to the manager. Mm. Absolutely, that's the thing. And like you, Gravenberg is a is a prime example. Like one of the big factors with him is that he went to United. Their captain is Bruno Fernandez. Bruno Fernandez is a really good player. He scores a a ton of goals. He's not a captain. He's in no way a captain. And what is he most notable for these days? Having a tantrum. Having a tantrum. Now, we've got Joel Matip, who is the king of the tantrum, but in a more productive, positive way. But we've got Virgil as our captain, who's also his international captain. And for Gravenberg, not only does he have someone there that's going to fight his corner, but he also has to impress Virgil because he knows that when Virgil goes with the national team, Ronald Koeman is saying, how's Ryan getting on? And Virgil's not going to lie and say, oh, yeah, oh, he's delighted. Oh, he's brilliant if he's acting the prick or if he's not putting in the effort. So it's both a good environment, but it's also a driving factor as well that will make him continue to want to improve. And there's a lot to improve, but there's an awful lot of talent. So hopefully it goes the right way for us. And we see more of what we saw against City, where he can come on and change games, uh, change games for us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it looks looks like a looks like a decent bunch. I don't think there's anyone, anything or anyone would um, get super super excited about in the list. But um, I think that sometimes those ones turn out to be even better. Than you expect? No, I think I, it's, it's, I th- I've enjoyed this one, Gags. I think it's been a, it's been a fun exercise, and um, yeah, to, to not be some no obvious standouts there. I don't think m- many people said, "Well, go and pick the list that the committee yeah. come up with." I think I think I love it when we do that. I think I love yeah. it when you guys pick out players that maybe you know aren't as popular out there or, or heard mm. of, and then when they do come to the fore elsewhere, if we don't go for them and they go elsewhere and they turn out to be great. It looks good on the on the group. Well, look at Van de Ven. We signed yeah, him on the last committee. The and he's done and he's done really well at Tottenham. Very <laughs> solid. Again, culture though there as well. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Positive very positive culture. culture. Very. Positive but the thing culture. about the thing about these players is, uh, like like Dan said, with with Weefer, with Tiete, these are very low risk signings. These are players that should translate very easily. Should have very easy settling in periods, and you're not expecting them to come in and be, you know, prime Sergio Busquets and prime Paolo Maldini. Hmm. You're expecting them to come in and be seven to eight out of 10 every week. And if they're that, we did the exciting thing in the summer and going and getting Dominic. We did the exciting thing the previous summer and going and getting uh, getting Darwin. They can't all be exciting signings. As Dan always says, you only need a couple of lads that can play the piano. You You need a big gang of lads that can carry a piano. And Matt Zwiefer yeah. and Arta Tiete and Arno Martinez are lads that will carry a piano for you. Now, Mascardo's the type of fellow who'll walk behind the piano, barking at you to make sure you carry it quick enough. And he might give you a kick if you don't carry it quick enough. But if you need him to step in and carry it, he can carry it as well. He's not going to mm-hmm. play it a whole lot, but he'll be there to dictate and make sure it all goes uh, accordingly. But he's the, like, we're signing, I think, three near sure things like near sure things in terms of we aren't going to miss out. Like we're not going to lose out on money with these. They're not going to be flops. They're going to come in and they're going to be solid. At the very least, they're great squad additions. Mascardo, though, he could be a top, top level player in that position. Like a really rare high end shielding defensive midfielder that you don't, you don't see. Like there's there's one great one in the world right now, and it's Rodri. Bubakar Kamara has the potential to get close to that level, but I don't think quite that level. But Mascardo, I said it earlier, and I don't say it lightly. Everybody knows how much I how much I think of Roy Keane, 
he reminds me of Roy Keane. And he's the first player in a long time that I've thought, yeah, you, a- you could be that guy in that role in the next 18 months. Like it might not even be a thing where it takes him three years to take that spot. He might take it in 12 months, 18 months because he's so, like this guy is undergoing university courses while carrying on a full-time degree and by all accounts is excelling in his course as well. So that points to being very, very intelligent and very well able to look after himself, to manage his time, to be doing all the right things on and off the pitch. And that's what you're looking for in a young player. Do you turn up on time? Do you put the work in? Do you, can your teammates rely on you? And with him, everything points to an absolutely bulletproof mindset, not the type who's going to get swayed, not the type who's going to lose track. Re- grown up with a really positive culture around him, at a club now they've taken really good care of him. He will make sure, this is why it doesn't look like he he will go to Chelsea, he doesn't look like he'll go to Chelsea because he's going to pick his next club based on what's best for my development. Not what's best for the bank, not what's best for, you know, the, the long-term security of my family and friends, what's best for my development. And if we get into that mix, I have no doubts that we can sell him on. This is the best club for your development. This is the club where you come in with great players around you, great young players as well, starting with, say, 25-year-old Trent and Alexis and those who are younger. This is a group that can grow together over the next five, six, seven years, post Mo, post Virgil, and be really, really, really special. And he could be a vital part of that. And that's where I think he'll make his decision. So uh, three that I, I think are, are sure things to, at the very worst, be great squad players, but I think can be certainly short-term fixtures in the 11 and one uber high ceiling midfielder who could be the best of the bunch. Wow. Fantastic. Nice. Thank you all for that. Uh, really appreciate your time uh, that you spend all three of you in, um, in making this podcast happen. And yes. um, yeah, I fun boss. Up. enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. And then I just turn up and, and host it and do nothing. But so, yeah, thank you very much, all three of you, for everything you do on the channel as well. Um, it is, it isn't what it is without you all. So, uh, and all of you listening as well, thank you so much for supporting us all, all the time. I don't get to say it much uh, often now. I used to say it every week, but um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we we'll, we will be back. We will be back in the summer. These guys will be back next week probably, but we will be back in the summer. With another one, which I'm sure will be another huge, huge summer for Liverpool FC, and let's hope it's um, it's one that follows a successful season. But uh, yeah, up the Reds. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.